TOA community, welcome back to the channel, everybody. Robert Linkle, trainingtheolderadult.com. I want to talk to you today about RIR, reps in reserve, and uh, a study that a colleague and kind of an up and coming uh, name. I mean, I, I, there are big names in our profession already. Mike Isratel is one of my favorite uh, people to learn from. I, I, uh, have seen the amount of work that he has put in his um, field of, of study is strength and conditioning with a specific focus on hypertrophy and strength gains. Um, he is at Lehman College in New York and works uh, alongside Dr. Brian Schoedfeld and uh, a, whole, a whole slew of great researchers and strength coaches in the world. And um, an individual that I saw on his uh, podcast and on his YouTube channel is Dr. Menno. Henselmans, Henselmans? Um, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but anyhow, I got turned to his page and he produces great content, really, really good stuff on Instagram. So uh, check out Menno. He just launched his new um, course as well that kind of teaches strength training. I think it's a certification of sorts and uh, just kind of launched that out in the last couple of weeks, if I'm um, correct on that. Anyhow, this particular article, he was looking at RIR, reps in reserve, and this study, they took a training rep range of one to two reps in reserve, or failure, which one would be greater for um, hypertrophy gains, okay? And so the way the study went was a new study in trained lifters with an average of eight years of experience compared training to failure versus leaving one to two reps in reserve, RIR. They trained one leg to true failure, literally failing on the last attempt, okay? And then they trained the other leg to two reps in reserve on the leg press and one rep in reserve on a leg extension. They averaged around 13 sets per week for the quadriceps. So for 10 weeks, the left leg, for example, would train to absolute maximal failure. On the leg press, they're pushing and they cannot do another one and they fail. And then on the right one, they would go, that rep, I've got two more in me, let's stop, okay? Quad extension, I uh, can't make it, left leg. Right leg, finished it, I could do maybe one more. So there was always at least one rep in reserve on the right leg, true failure on the left leg. The findings across the board here were basically identical. Okay, basically identical. After eight weeks, quad muscle growth was virtually identical in both legs. But what they found was there was a, uh, a neurological response on the group that trained, the, the leg that trained to failure, where basically it just struggled to recover. And if you're, you're basically gonna get the same result of either training to true maximum or leaving one to two reps in reserve, but the one to two reps in reserve group has a easier time recovering for the next training session, would it not make sense to maybe not neurologically damage your body by stressing and pushing to failure on every set or every major complex compound lift and thinking that you're really producing the best or getting the best out of this when if you left one to two reps in reserve, you may have a better opportunity to recover, but also get the same, you know, the same result. Uh, the failure group consistently suffered greater neuromuscular fatigue, indicating a worse stimulus to fatigue ratio. And uh, they went into, um, the results are in line with many previous studies, but directly uh, con uh, contraindicated that the last five reps of the set were the most effective reps in the model. That basically would now suggest that the last three reps up to a reps in reserve of one to two left would be the most important ones, okay? Does that make sense? I don't know if I said that very well, but basically suggesting that previous thought was if you pushed yourself in those last five reps to the point where the last rep was literally the last one you could produce, that those, the assumption was those were the five reps where the maximum growth to your musculature was being uh, achieved. 
And, and now we're understanding that you could look at those same five reps and go, let's just do one, two, and three, not do four and five. Get the same result of muscle growth, but not have the neuromuscular damage and fatigue that would typically occur if we did push to that. So my body can recover more efficiently so I could train it again maybe sooner, right? Instead of taking a 48 hour, I could do a 24 hour or instead of taking 72 hours, I could take 48 hours. Most cases, this is in bodybuilding world. And so they're doing, you know, chest and triceps on a Monday and they're not touching their chest and their triceps again until Thursday or Friday, something like that. So they'll take at least three or four days in between major muscle group uh, training sessions. Maybe if you don't push to that absolute maximum failure, you could come back on you know Wednesday instead of Thursday and be able to train again, Some, something along those lines. Or just having the, the body not be as exhausted as a whole so the next day when you come back to train back and biceps and then on Wednesday when you do shoulders and legs or whatever your split is, you're not completely wiped because the neuromuscular system is the whole system. It's not like, well, my legs are completely fine and operate at 100%, but my chest and my triceps are neuromuscularly zapped to 50%. Like it, it doesn't necessarily work like that. Yeah, you are fatigued and tired in your pecs and your triceps, but the whole system has to work. That's why days that if you overtrain your upper body and then you come back the next day and you try to train legs, you're like, I'm just tired. I can't perform. I can't produce. Well, why? My legs didn't do anything yesterday. The system was zapped. The neuromuscular system, you only have so much, right? The, the engine that runs the vehicle turns the front wheels and the back wheels. And, and, you know, everything is being generated via this engine. The whole vehicle is, is affected, right? Like everything is being propelled and moved by this. So it's silly to be like, well, only the front wheels actually did anything today. The back wheel should be completely fit. No, the engine runs the whole thing, man. It's either all exhausted and overheating or it's all recovering. And this, this research for the general consumer suggests one thing, that you don't need to push yourself to a maximal injury risking level. And, and I say that lightly because pushing to a maximum does not mean you're gonna get hurt. That's, that's, there's actually not a lot of research to support that. But if you had to look at when do injuries occur? Do they occur with more often with maximal attempts or submaximal attempts? Okay, I think they're, and this is just general recognition, recognition, uh, recognition Jesus, general, what am I trying to say here? Recollection is that when you work with maximal loads, there is a slightly higher opportunity for injury versus submaximal loads being slightly safer. So if we're going to have that potential opportunity, if I can just reduce my risk of injury just by a little bit, then I will gladly take that even though I'm going to get the same result across the board. So I think this is a pretty great finding. And that's why when I saw it, I went, okay, this is worth us talking about here because even though we're not in the world of bodybuilding necessarily, we are training towards higher efforts. And I do want to have a hypertrophy based effect with my clients. I do want their muscles to get a little bigger and stronger, but I also don't want to push to the point and really have never pushed any of our clients to the point where this is, we've found your maximal effort. Okay. I trained a couple of clients for powerlifting years ago they found true maximal efforts. Everybody else, it's just been, let's train to a muscular endured failure, which means, okay, I can do, you know, whatever weight for a set of 15 or 20. When you get to that, you're like, here's my maximum. I cannot do another one. I get that. But I'm talking about like true one rep performance maximums, and we just don't do that, right? So <clears throat> finding this information, okay, we can get good results, get strong, have some muscular growth, but keep maybe one to two, even three reps in reserve, and we're gonna be a-okay. Comments, questions, let me know what you think in the uh, comment section down below. Please subscribe, ring that bell, don't miss any of our content coming up. Appreciate you all, hope you're doing well, and until next time, continue to fight your good fight against Sarcopenia. Take care.